fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power.
You may be seated. Well, my name is Pastor Scott, and it's a joy to welcome you here this morning, as well as those who are viewing online. We welcome you. We wish you could be with us, but we understand when there are times when you can't. We're glad that you can join us that way. If this is your first time or one of your first times with us, a special welcome to you. And if you would do us a favor and just take that card in front of you in the pew rack and fill that out, uh, that will give us an opportunity to thank you for coming, to tell you a little bit more about the church. And you can drop those off either in the offering plate on your way out or at the hub. Now, if you're a visitor, we don't expect you to put anything except that welcome card in the offering plate. You're our guests, and we don't expect anything from you financially. Uh, but those of you who call FAC your home church, let me just on behalf of the leadership of the church thank you for being so generous in your donations that allow us to have ministries here. We thank you for that, and um, I know God will bless you for it as well. Also, for those of you who are trying to learn more about the church, you can go to the hub after the, the service is over. Just go through the doors. You'll see a great big sign that says the hub, and you can get your questions answered there. You could even turn in your welcome card there, and uh, that's a good place to turn that in as well. I have a few announcements to share with you this morning. The first one is we have a five-week course called Finding My Fit that's starting soon. That's designed to help you discover your spiritual gifts and how you can use them, obviously at church, but in more than just the church, also at work and in your relationships with others. And if you'd like to learn more about that, or if you're just ready to sign up right now, there's a table in the back in the lobby that you can ask questions or sign up. Uh, that will be back there April 7th and today and next week as well. And then it starts the following week on April 21st, and it will happen during the second hour, so at 11 a.m. Also, we have, uh, starting today, our uh, FAC youth will be starting their fundraiser for their summer trip to Denver, Colorado with Lead the Cause. And for those of you that don't know, Lead the Cause is a conference where our students will spend the week learning about evangelism and then also putting into play what they've learned uh, during that week to bless and serve the community of Denver. Now, many of our young adults could share their testimonies of how this trip impacted their lives when they were youth as well. But one way to see that is actually by watching to see how our, our young adults are serving in our church and in the community. So we're extending an invitation to you to join us in supporting our students who will be going on this trip. And I think many of you are familiar with how we do that, but let me just uh, fill in the rest of you. Uh, it's a pretty simple way, out in the lobby, over on this side, there are a couple of big boards over there. And there are envelopes that were decorated by the students who are going to be going. You'll also see their pictures and names so that you know who you're praying for. So each envelope has a number written on it. And the number of the envelope indicates the amount that you're going to give. So in case you were wondering, this is a guideline. It's not a commandment. So if you picked up envelope number 20, but you had prayerfully decided to give $30, you can do that. And if you had prayerfully decided to give $10, but the only envelope that was left was the one that said a million dollars, you can still give the $10 guilt-free. Now, can I just say, uh, can we not have people fighting over the million-dollar envelope this year? That was so embarrassing last spring to watch you guys go after that. So let's just show a little discretion this year. Now, when you're ready to turn those in, uh, put the money in the envelope and then just put it in the offering plates as you would normally do with your gifts. This uh, fundraiser begins today and it ends on May the 5th. And so let me thank you in advance on behalf of our students and our youth leaders for doing this. If you have any questions, you can talk to our youth pastor, Pastor Chen, about that. Now we're going to invite Wes Palmer to come up and share with us a special announcement for the men's Bible study. Thank you, Scott. Good morning, first service. Um, as Scott said, my name is Wes Palmer. I have the privilege and honor to serve you all as an elder, uh, but also as the men's ministry leader. Um, over the past 12 weeks, uh, we had approximately 25 men uh, that have committed 
to going through a, uh, a study called the Resolution for Men. Um, <clears throat> this is a study that's called, it's a, it's a call to action for all the men. And uh, it's, it's a call to action for men to courageously step up and do whatever it takes to be the leader in their home, to be involved in their children's lives, to be the husband that they've, God's called us to be, to lead our families, to be a visual representation of what the character of God really is. This is, this is something that's been missing in our churches, in the community, in our homes. We want to be able to model how to walk with integrity, treat others with respect, call out to our children to be the responsible men and women that they need to be. And we also are committing to loving and honoring our wives. Some men will hear this and they'll mock it. Some men will hear it and they'll ignore it. But what we've learned over the last past 12 weeks, regardless of our past, we, many of us have those skeletons. We have past that we don't always want to talk about. But regardless of what our pasts are, these statements, very hard to read, but you can see me after the service. I can give you a copy. But these statements are commitments that we've made. You'll see that they start with I will. Twelve of them. Twelve commitments saying I will. To love God for the rest of our days. To teach our children and our future children to do the same. To love and to mentor others. To love our spouse and to honor her. All these statements we do for the glory of God. And we invite other men to do the exact same thing. In my home, the decision's already been made. Who will guide my family? I will. I'm the father. I will guide my family. Who will teach my son and daughter to follow Christ? I will. Who will provide, protect, pr pray for them, pray for my family to do what God has called them to do as well? I will. I accept this responsibility and the privilege and it's a privilege to embrace that. I want to hear the favor of God and his blessing upon my home. So where are you, men of courage? Where are you, men of faith? It's time to rise up and answer the call that God gave us all. It's time to say, I will, I will, I will. I'd like to ask any of the men who are here today that have committed uh, over the last 12 weeks, if you could stand up, if you could, we can just recognize you. This was a call to action for the men as well, but it's a call to action for the church. I ask you to invite us. I, I invite you to join us. I'm sorry. I invite you to join us. Walk with us. Hold us accountable. Hold us accountable to be the men that God created us to be. Pray for these men that we're standing. Pray for the men in your lives. Pray for all the men within this church as well. We do not take this commitment lightly or passively. We just ask you to join us, support us, pray for us. If any, any, any men that want more information on this resolution or even just any of the men's ministry, I ask that you just come see me after the service and we can talk more about that. But just continue to pray for the men within this church. Pray for the men that have the opportunity to, throughout the communities to be the men that God called them to be. Thank you very much. I get excited about being in part of a church where we have uh, uh, leaders who stand up for men's ministry because uh, we know that it's important for, for guys to be spiritual leaders in, in homes and, and in the community. That gets me excited. Gets me excited that we're not we're not passive. It gets me excited that we're not just sitting back. It gets me excited that we're not a church that just wants to come and sit and feel good, um, or just come and sit and read something and never put it into practice. But we're a church that actually wants to do things, and the things that we want to do are reach our community, to share the message of the gospel and put it into the hearts and the lives of other people to encourage them and to challenge them all along as we grow, as we challenge ourselves, as, as God challenges us in our own spiritual life. 
It's, uh, it's, it's not, it's not a, and, and Wes would be one of the first ones to tell you, it's not, it's not follow me because I'm such a good guy. It's let's walk this together because this world is hard. And so I'm excited that from our children's ministry to our student ministry to uh, adult ministries, men and women, and even into our uh, senior adult ministries, we're a church that's committed to focusing on Christ. We're a church that says the best thing that we could do, the first thing that we should do, the most important thing that we should do is turn our eyes towards him. And this morning, uh, as we often do, the first Sunday of the month, we come to share communion. Communion is, a, is another reminder of the things that we just talked about. It's another reminder of, of our opportunity to remember what Christ has done for us. Communion is this, is this time where it's, it's both a time of reflection and remembrance. Uh, we gather our hearts around this table to express gratitude uh, to Christ for what he's done for us, but not just to express gratitude, uh, but in fact, in order to express gratitude, we have to be reminded of what took Christ to the cross, and that was our sin. It was our brokenness. It was the sin that was in this world that took him there. He willingly did it. He willfully did it as part of God's plan for us. And so as we come to the table, we do so with a moment of introspection, examining our hearts to see if, if there's something not right between us and God, a moment of personal reflection to see if there's something that's that we need to confess before God, something that we need to uh, uh, be sure about before God. A moment to ask the question, God, are, are we good? Do I need to understand something about myself that I'm missing? Am I good with my family? Am I good with my kids? Am I, am I good with my, my friends and my connections around me? Is there something that I need to take responsibility for and make right? And so this morning, I would encourage us to take a moment uh, to examine ourselves, to confess our sin, to commit to making right relationships and to turn our heart to God through Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. So in a moment, we're going to sing a song, and as we do, I'm going to ask you to take the time during that song and use this song as a kind of confession. Use this song as a time to turn our hearts back to God uh, and, and just reflect and ask ourselves that question, God, how are we doing? Where do I need to come to you? Reveal yourself to me. And so as we sing, if you've not had the opportunity to grab one of the communion elements, just raise your hand and uh, one of our uh, ushers will be happy to, to get them to you. Uh, keep your hand raised. We've got two down here. Anybody else up top? Just let us know uh, and we'll be happy to, to get those to you uh, at this time. And so as we enter this time of reflection, please uh, use this song uh, to do that as well. Would you stand with us as we sing?
to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before. Yet not I, but Christ in me. Will you join me in this prayer of confession? Would you read it with me? Let us read it together in unison. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord Jesus, on the night on which he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he shared it with his disciples, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me the body of Christ given for you. Let us eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. It's a new promise between God and man. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of Christ given for you, let us take together. Amen. Pastor Scott, would you come and lead us in our scripture reading? I'm gonna be reading from Acts this morning. And buckle your seats because I'm going through all 28 chapters. I'm not, but I am reading the whole first chapter, and I just thought if I said 28, then you wouldn't hold it against me if I read a whole chapter. So Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, and this is Dr. Luke writing this, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, 
Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into the heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as, as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field, and there he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language a Cadelema, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us in his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apost apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the eleven apostles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, first of all, we are so grateful for giving us this word and preserved it over these many, many thousands of years so that we can look at it and read it and be confident that it is exactly what you wanted preserved, that it gives to us the teachings of Jesus, that it tells us how to live our lives in a way pleasing to you, and it tells us how to share with others this good news that was at one time shared with us. And Father, as we also have partaken in uh, communion this morning, a regular reminder to us that we did not come by this salvation of our own good works because we are such wonderful people, but quite the opposite. We are unable to obtain salvation on our own. And because of that and because of your great love and because of your holiness, you provided a way for us to come into a relationship with you through the death and resurrection of your beautiful son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for Pastor Ben this morning as he opens your word to us, that um, at the same time you would open our ears and our hearts, that you would take away any distractions that have followed us in this morning so that we can hear your word and obey it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand together and sing one more song of worship? Great. 
Break the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my Father, we come to you this morning uh, rejoicing and excited that death has lost its grip. Amen? Death has lost its grip on us. We are free 
And Father, we are free because of what Jesus has done for us. Not because of us, not because of anything that we do, not because of how good we are or how good looking we are or how great we are or what good things we do, none of that. It's only because that Jesus laid down his life for us out of obedience and after that obedience was brought back to life by God with new life for us that's given for us. When we believe in that, when we surrender to God through you, Jesus, because of your, your body that was given and broken for us, because of your blood that was shed as redemption for us, you give us life. You free us. You give us hope. You give us a future. Again, not just one day, someday. Yes, there is an eternal destiny that is secured, but it's also lived out every single day right here, right where we are. And so, Father, we are grateful for that. And we come to you this morning rejoicing once again this week in victory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. He is risen. Turn to somebody and say, welcome to First Alliance Day. Good to see you. You can go ahead and have a seat. You know, I just thought I'd throw out that he is risen one more time just to see if you'd pick up on it. You know, you don't have to just say it at Easter. You know, you're allowed to say it other times. So, so good to have you with us. What a great week we had last week, Easter Sunday, right? So glad to see many of you with us last week with family and friends. And what a fantastic weekend we had. Another good week this week. And, and let's hear, would you thank the worship team again and, and our tech team for leading us today? They do such a great job. We're so thankful for that. And, uh, you know, so I was thinking about what do, we, what do, you, so what do you do after Easter? right? Like, what do you talk about after Easter? And I was thinking, what did the disciples do after Easter? What did they do? Like, what, what, when the, those people that followed Jesus around, like, they were so distraught over the weekend, right? And then, and then Easter Sunday morning, Jesus is risen from the dead. They're celebrating. And then they wake up Monday morning, and it's like, now what do we do? Now, like, what's next? Like, that was the pinnacle, right? Like, what else am I supposed to do now? Right? And so I was thinking about that, and I'm like, last week we celebrated victory, right? The victory that Jesus brings us. And now this week I'm like, now what do we do? Well, I, like we won, right? Like we're supposed to hold the trophy, have a parade, ticker tape, all that kind of, right? What do we, what do, we do now? What do we do now? And so as I thought about that, I thought, you know what? Here's the, here, here's the easy thing. Let's just go back to the book of Acts. Let's do what they did right? I think sometimes we overcomplicate the church. Like we overcome, like what, what should we do? What should, I don't know. Let's just do what they did. Let's just do what the early church did. Let's just do what the disciples did. Let's just do what they did. And maybe, maybe as we translate that for our culture and our communities today, maybe we'll see God do something, right? Maybe, maybe we can pick up on a few things that we didn't recognize before, or maybe we'll pick up on a few things that, that we forgot. Maybe we'll be reminded of some things. Oh, yeah, I should really be doing, I should be, I, that, you're right, I kind of lost focus. I should, and maybe we'll find some things, some tips, some, some ideas of how we should be living our lives post-resurrection. What does, what does our life look like after the victory? How should we be living? What should we be doing? What is God asking of us in these days? I don't think it's a big surprise to you. I'm a sports fan, right? A sports fan. Any other sports fans in the room? Good, good, good. We, we lament. I'm a, steel, I'm a Pittsburgh fan. I'm a Pittsburgh fan. So I live with glory in the winter, and I live in misery in the summer. So, um, but that's a football, baseball reference if you didn't get it. But um, so, and I've, I've coached high school sports, I've coached junior high sports, I've coached football for a long time. And in, in athletics, in athletics, if you played a sport, you probably know this, um, there's something a team does. When, you, when your team is guaranteed victory, you know you're winning this game. You know you are. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a game that's run by a clock and possession, right? So think basketball, think hockey, think uh, football, things like that. When you know you're going to win, victory is secured, right? It's 100 to nothing, right? You know you're going to win. Something that the team does when they have uh, control 
is they go into what's called victory formation. Victory formation. And it's, it's a, it's a, in, in football, it's a, it's a lineup where they're going to snap the ball and they're going to take a knee and everybody's going to celebrate victory formation, right? Because they know they're going to win, right? In basketball, uh, I don't know if we'll see this this weekend with the finals, but in basketball, if you know you're going to win, you, you, you spread the court. You go four corners. And you're just holding the ball. And you got four corners. You got your point guard up high just dribbling the ball running out the clock, because you know you're going to win. In hockey, similar stuff, right? They go four corners on the blue line. They just pass it back and forth. Soccer, I don't know about that sport, but whatever. Like, they just kick it back and forth to each other. That's really the whole game. But anyway, right? So you know you're going to win, and so you go into, although you have the ball, you go into, like, a defensive posture, right? And it's almost like, it's okay, we kind of relax, we kind of, we, it's very protective, it's very low risk, there's zero engagement, we're not engaging with the other team, zero engagement, we just relax. Well, as we look through the first chapter of the book of Acts, I think what we see coming off the victory last week is Jesus setting up his followers and what would then become the church. Let's not rush ahead of ourselves and call them the church yet. They didn't even know they were called the church yet. They were just 120 followers hanging out, right? So what Jesus is doing after the victory of the weekend is he's setting up his followers for what would come next. He's actually designing a victory formation with his disciples. This is what victory looks like. This is what victory is going gonna, is gonna to sound like for us. Yet it's not passive. The difference between what Jesus is setting up and what we see in our sports culture is that this victory formation that Jesus says setting up isn't passive. In fact, it's aggressive. The victory formation that Jesus calls his followers to after the resurrection is aggressive, it's high risk, and it's filled with engagement. When when we read through the books of Acts, we're going to be in the book of Acts for the next eight weeks, okay? We're not going to read every word of every chapter, like that would take three years, right? We're not doing that. We're going to do a summary over, over the next eight weeks of the book of Acts, but this is what I'm going to tell you. As you read it, and I hope that you'll read ahead and read in advance of us. I hope that as you read it, you will see that the victory formation that Jesus is defining um, as a movement and a mission, as a movement and a mission, the Christ followers who follow him, who then become the church later on, the, the, the movement and the mission is filled with risk. It's filled with engagement. And it's aggressive. It's not passive at all. There's no sitting back and letting the world come to them. They go out and they step out and they step into the world. There's no relaxing. There's no resting on their laurels. They had no laurels to rest on. They were just starting. And in the just starting, they had to figure it out. Where do we go? What do we do? How do we do this? God, what are you asking of us through Jesus, who is now resurrected, and and us as followers? What do you want us to do in the world? And as we move through the book of Acts, we're going to see Jesus guiding these early followers and the early church into high risk, full engagement, and appropriately aggressive interaction with the communities that they live in. This victory formation is not designed to play it safe. This is designed to advance the church, again, as a movement and a mission. And so as we look at Acts chapter 1, and and again, for time today, I'm not going to go back and reread every verse that Pastor Scott read for us, The scripture has been read. I will go back and refer to it. But here's what we're going to find in Acts chapter 1. What does this victory formation look like? What is Jesus asking of the church? Some of the elements that we'll notice as God begins to form this new movement and mission are these. First of all, there's an order in God's plan. Secondly, there's, there's an investment. Third, there's a challenge. And fourth, 
There's a certain character that's being developed in the people who are a part of this. There's an order in what God is doing. There's an investment being made. There's a challenge that's given, and there's a certain character that's being built into the lives of those who are participating in God's program. Uh, Scott already mentioned to it that Luke is the author of Acts, and so Luke is, is, is really just just closing the one chapter of the Gospel of Luke and beginning to write the next chapter, which is the book of Acts. The Gospel of Luke was everything that Jesus did and said. The, 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 the book of Acts now follows what did the followers of Jesus do and say. So the gospel is all about what Jesus did. The book of Acts, that's why it's called the Acts of the Apostle. It's what they did, right? It's the action that they took, is now following their lives of the post-resurrection. And as we move through, as we move through Acts chapter 1, we notice that there is order in God's plan. Verse 4, on one occasion, he, Jesus was eating them, he gave this, and he gave them this commandment. Don't run, don't rush through this, but watch this. He said, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you had heard me speak about. Now, you and I are like, mm, what's that gift, what's that gift? In context, they just talked about that gift like four nights ago. In context of Acts, like four nights ago was the upper room discourse and Jesus said, listen, I'm going to go away, but the Holy Spirit is going to come. This is John chapter 14, 15, 16. The Holy Spirit is going to come. My father's going to send you the Holy Spirit who will guide and teach and give counsel and and, and be uh, one that walks with you. So that's the promise he's talking about here. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised you for John baptized with water. But in a few days, here it is, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's an order to God's plan. And it starts with, in this context, don't leave but wait. Don't leave but wait. I think a lot of us get super excited to be engaged in what God's doing. That we, that we sometimes rush into things. That sometimes we jump at opportunities. Hey, our church is doing this. Great, I'm going to go do that. And then next week, our church is doing this. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to run over. I'm going to do this for our church. I'm going to do this for our community. I'm going to do this for God. I mean, and soon we get like overloaded with things to do, not really having the passion for any of them, not really having the direction for them, just getting involved in it. It's very interesting to me that Jesus, in this context, the resurrection has happened, victory is secured. We're going to start advancing and building the, the kingdom of God in the world. But here's the first thing I want you to do I want you to wait. I don't want you to leave. Don't leave, don't leave, but wait. Now, here it was for a very specific purpose, right? What was the purpose? The purpose was so that you could have the Holy Spirit fill you with power. Verse six, they gathered around him and asked, Lord, uh, verse 6, they gather around him and ask, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said, it, it, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set. So here, do you see the excitement of the disciples? Like, all right, Jesus is with us. All right, something's going to happen. Hey, is this the time? Right, you can hear them getting excited. Is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom? Right? Is this the time? Is this the time? Is this the time? And Jesus is like, hold on, just wait, just wait. Because there's something that's very important that's about to happen. Because if you go running after it right now, you're going to miss the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we get all excited about dates and times and calendars and things going on, right? We're drawing circles around world events and we're drawing timelines to our favorite scriptures and we're saying this is all happening, right? I I hear something's going on tomorrow. (laughs) We're in the path of something. And uh, we got all these Twitter preachers throwing stuff. I'm going to... I don't know. Everybody wants to know when the end is coming, right? 
Everybody wants to know, when's the end coming? When's the end? This is it. This is it. Well, in 1988, I was told this was it, and it wasn't it. And then in 1989, I was told this was it because the guy miscalculated in 88. Let's, glad he doesn't work for NASA. I, you want to know the time? Here's the time right here. Let's hear it from Jesus himself. You want to know it? Here it is. It's not for you to know. Verse 7. There you go. Not for you to know. You want to know the time? Here's the time. We, we say it in our house this way. None yet. What do you mean, none yet? None your business. That's the time. But when are you coming back? None yet. Jesus says, I don't even know. Like the father's, when the father tells me, I'll let you know. See, we get all caught up in some extracurriculars. And in the book of Acts, what I see is that God has an order to what he's doing. And the order is this. Wait for my direction. Wait for my direction. First thing in context, in the context of chapter 1, he said, I just need you to wait for a few days because we're not ready. Wait until we're ready. How do we know when we're ready? The Holy Spirit will come and tell you. And when the Holy Spirit comes and tells you, then you can step out. And, and, and we all want to be like, well, well when's, 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 when's the this, when's the that? And, and Jesus is saying right here, right here, don't get ahead of yourself. Don't get ahead of yourself. It's not for you to know everything. And the things that I want you to know, I'll tell you. So here's what I want you to do. Wait. Just wait. God has an order to the things that he's doing. In the book of Acts, we're going to see how God moves people through different stages and in different ways. In this first chapter, in this first moment, he just simply wants them to wait because something is coming that they need, that they don't know that they need it. But if they start running out before time, they're going to miss what they need. And everything that they're going to do is going to look good in the immediate. And then it's going to all fall apart. And they're going to be like, what in the world happened? And Jesus is going to be like, I told you to wait. Just wait for the Holy Spirit. Now, there's, there's a handful of things that you're going to, as we walk through this series, there are three things that we cannot get away from. The, the, these three threads are woven in some way, shape, or form throughout all the chapters of Acts, and it's this, the power of the Holy Spirit, the name of Jesus, and baptism. You can't get away from it. You can't get away from it in the book of Acts. We have to do something with the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, and baptism. What is God asking of us? There's an order to things, but also there's an investment. There's an investment. Notice in verse 8, but when you receive the power, when you receive the Holy Spirit, when the power, hang on, I'm getting ahead of myself. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Do you see the investment? The investment is the Holy Spirit and his power in our lives. God's not acting in some random fashion. God is not acting in some random way. The movement and the mission of the new church is based on order and investment. The Holy Spirit needs to be deposited into you. And when the Holy Spirit is in us, we then have the power to take forward the name and then baptize people who have surrendered to him in the future, in our communities. And look at what he does. President Stumbo talked about this a couple weeks ago. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. I was sitting out there and I'm like, Mr. President, you're stealing my thunder. But he's the president, so I let him steal the thunder. The point is, we have an order, we have an investment, and that's the power of the Holy Spirit moving in our lives. That word power is in the Greek, the word dunamis, from where we get our word dynamite, which is explosive power. Think about, what does dynamite do? Dynamite explodes, casts out energy, and changes things. And Jesus is saying, you can, if you don't wait, order, for the investment, the Holy Spirit, 
You're going to go try to do things and it's not going to work right because what you need is the power of the Holy Spirit that I've promised to give you. So just wait for that. And as we are filled with the power of the Spirit, we can walk in that investment. So as we look at our, as ourselves and we ask, God, what are you doing in our world? What are you doing in our church? What are you doing around us? We know this, it's through the power of the Spirit that God wants to move in us and through us. Whatever the church is going to do and to, going to become, whatever it is, they don't know. Acts chapter 1, they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know how this thing is going to play out. But whatever the church is going to do and become, it will be because of the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of people. Not because of our efforts, not because we can sing good songs and play good music and and have good Bible studies. It's not because of that. It's because of the power of the Holy Spirit. He He refocuses us for the task, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. We don't, you know what's amazing? We don't have to guess where God wants us to invest, right? There's no guessing. Where do you want, God, where do you want our church to be involved? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. It's not, not hard. But I need you to do it with the deposit of the Holy Spirit in your life or else, man, I don't know. It just doesn't have the same effect. It doesn't have the same power. So we see a, a, a order. We see investment. I'm I'm up against the clock. Notice the challenge. Notice the challenge, verse 10. They were looking intently up into the sky as as he was going because in verse 9 he was taken up before them. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, men of Galilee. I love this. I love, I I don't know, I kind of chuckled at this when I was reading it. I found a little bit of like uh, direct humor from heaven. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? What are you doing? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go. Jesus is taken up. Jesus gives us wait for the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, go go impact your community. Go impact your, your school district. Go impact your state. Go impact your world. Do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he was taken up. He ascended into heaven. And they did what we would do. We just looked around like, what happened? And I love heaven. Men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking in the sky? I feel like, in a sense, heaven looks at us and says, now get on with it. Let's go. Quit looking in the sky. Quit looking around. Quit, quit stargazing and go after what God is asking us to go after. It's time to get on it. It reminded me that, that, phrasing, that phrasing at the end, this Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will, will come back in the same way, will come back. It reminded me of Luke chapter 19 where Jesus told the parable of, of, of the money. He, he gave money to certain individuals and he said, I'm going to go away, I'm gonna, but before I go away, I'm going to give you this money and I'm expecting you to do something with it, and I will come back. I will come back. And when I come back, I want to know, what did you do with the money that I gave you? And I think Jesus is asking us, I've invested something in you, and I'm asking you to now go and do it. And there's going to be a day when I come back, and I'm going to ask What did you do with it? And I don't want to be the church that's standing around in the parking lot looking in the sky all day. I want to be the church that's actually out there doing it. There's an order to things. There's an investment. There's a challenge to us. But it also does something to their character. Notice this. They came back from, from that event, and they're like, we got we to gotta do something um, with our team here. And they went up to the room where they were staying, and it said all of these people were present. And in verse 14, it said this about them. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. 
In the English Standard Version, verse 14 says it this way, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus. All these with one accord. Devoting themselves to prayer. All of these with one accord. Don't just, don't just, don't just look at that and think unity. There is unity in that. But that word, that phrase, with one accord, also carries the idea of similar passion. They were all together and had similar passion. The last time I checked, passion is not passive. It doesn't just sit back, but it's fully engaged. It takes risks. Passion. The character that was being developed in the hearts and the lives of these people, two things. They had similar passion and they were devoted to prayer. They had similar passion and they were devoted to prayer. Next week, I'm so excited, we start our pastor's prayer partners back on Sunday mornings. But the other thing that we're doing this week that we want you to know about is we're launching our 21 days of prayer. Another season of 21 days of prayer starts today. We're asking us as a church, what would happen if we had a similar passion and devoted ourselves to prayer? We have these available at the hub and you can also download them online. But what would happen if we prayed specifically targeted and together? Now, don't try to become like one of those, I missed, I missed number day one, so I can't keep doing it. I've got to catch it next year. No, just pick up where you're at. But have you noticed in the fall we did 21 days of prayer? In January, we took seven weeks and did the Lord's Prayer. Now we're coming, and what's the first thing that's happening in the book of Acts? They devoted themselves to prayer. Jesus is telling us there's something about the character of his church that we have to understand, and it's this, this devotion to prayer. And in verse 24, when they had to, when they had to replace Judas Iscariot on their team, notice what it says. They prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two is to take his place. And then they cast lots. They rolled the dice. How did they make their decision? Well, they did roll dice to figure it out. But they rolled dice after they prayed and asked God to show them. Don't miss what is happening in the early church. Don't miss what God is doing in the hearts and the lives of people. These were people who were called to a deeper character commitment, one that was grounded in prayer and reliance on the Holy Spirit. As I close this this morning, this is what I want you to see from the movement and the mission in the book of Acts. There was an utter dependence on the Holy Spirit. There's an utter dependence on the Holy Spirit. Prayer permeated their life decisions. They, they, they were not merely uh, found to be unified, but they had a similar passion. There was an urgency to get into what God had called them to. There was a map of the mission. They knew where they were supposed to go. They refocused their priorities. Don't get ahead of myself. Let the Holy Spirit guide me. They verbalized what they had seen and heard. Be my witnesses. And there was a reliance on power that changes lives. So this morning, I simply ask us this. I invite us to step into that victory formation. I invite you to step into that victory formation. I invite you to join us in this movement and this mission. Jesus, Jesus invested in and empowered people to carry forward the life change that happens when people discover Jesus. Put faith in him to forgive their sins and, and to lead their lives. The moment, the movement of the church begins with the movement of people. It's not a movement of an organization, it's a movement of people who have gathered together with similar passion, a commitment to prayer, a dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit, and say, 
Let's see what God's going to do. Well, I'm excited to see what God is doing at FAC. I'm interested to see what he's doing in each and every one of our hearts. So will you join us? For some, it's, it's time to give our lives to Christ. It's, it's time. You know, we've been, we've been like, I've been putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. But this Jesus that you talk about, I'm going to trust him to forgive my sin and to lead my life because this is not working anymore. It's time. And so your prayer is pretty simple. Lord Jesus, forgive me and lead me. I believe in you. For some of us, it's time to come home. It's time to stop running. It's time to say, I'm done with this. I want to, I want to be in victory formation. I'm tired of being on the, on the other side where you think you're winning and then at the end you realize you've really lost. It's time. Forgive me. And then for others, for some of us, it's, it's pretty simple that, that we need, that there is something that I mentioned that you're like, you know what, that's, that's the one thing that's missing. And I don't know if it's, if it's maybe over the course of the next few weeks or maybe into this summer, but that's the thing I want to go after in my relationship with God. This morning, we have that opportunity. Will you stand with me as we close in prayer and see what God does in our midst as we journey through the book of Acts? Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for this, this hour of worship that we've had. And I pray right now that, that you would help us to see where we are. If we need, if we need that to take that step of salvation and, and that, that surrender our life to you, God, I pray that we would have the courage to pray that prayer. God, forgive me of my sins and lead my life through the work of Jesus, I believe. For some of us, forgive me for, for wandering. Help me to come home. Help me to come back to faith. And for others, God, keep poking at us in that area that you want us to grow in that was mentioned this morning. We believe you're doing something, and we're excited for that. Help us to carry this with us this week. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, just before you go, if you made a decision about that, can you just mark your welcome card, drop it in the, in the offering plate? We'd love to circle back with you and connect with you. If you'd like to talk to us about that, we'll be down front. Also, it's a communion Sunday. So at the end, if any of you want prayer for healing, which is a practice that we do in the church, come on down. We'll, we'll have some of our elders with us. And we'll be happy. I'm excited for the book of Acts, for the movement and the mission and what God is doing. I hope you are too. We'll see you next week.